Hi, this is Annie Lepley. I'm the Executive Director at the Randor Memorial Library in Wayne, Pennsylvania. On April 22nd, 2020, we celebrated National Library Week and Earth Day with a conversation with Beth Kephart, one of our hometown authors. Reference librarian Pam Sador and Kathy Feeback of Main Point Books joined Beth to discuss her newest book, The Great Upending. I hope you enjoy their conversation. And I was sent an early co um, copy of The Great Up Ending. And of course, I had to read it immediately. And then I had to wait like, I don't know, six months until I could actually talk about it, which was so sad. Um, Beth, your books are always beautifully written. They're always lyrical. Um, and um, they always surprise me. There's always something that I read that I, I'm not expecting. Um, I had never heard of Marfan Syndrome before I read this book. What inspired you? Well, Kathy and Pam and Annie and all of you, thank you so much um, again um, for being here and for creating this this evening. And um, there's somebody very special um, among all of you, very special people who, who is here with us tonight, and that is Becca. And <clears throat> I can barely speak because she's um, and what inspired this book is, is many things. Um, but several years ago when I was writing patient stories as part of my corporate freelance work, I was asked to call a young woman named Becca. And Becca had a story to tell, and she had prepared her story magnificently. And she had uh, impressed me with her intelligence and her grace. And I hung up from what maybe was an hour of phone call, but I couldn't get Becca out of my mind. And she was kind enough to allow our conversation to continue. Um, Becca does have Marfan syndrome, but she's hardly defined by that. She is smart and she is funny and she has wonderful relationships with her cat and she has a plant garden um, right near her bed. And our relationship continued over email. And uh, I love her and I wanted to write a book for her, not about her. And this book emerged from that desire to somehow capture her essence and to give her something. Um, but there's essence, there's people, there are characters and stories, but there also must be landscape. And so at a time that was similar, uh, sort of in the stretch of, of my life, my husband and I had created a, a workshop program, extraordinary memoir workshops, we said, in extraordinary places. And the first place that we chose to hold one was a farm in McClure, Pennsylvania. And uh, we had these extraordinary women who trusted us and this farm and, and, and showed up and were there with us in all their magnificent beauty and in all the things we learned together and what we learned from Sally and her husband Ken who owned the farm and who cooked every meal from, from, the, uh, from their land who took us out to see their pigs, who allowed us to walk that, that land and take photographs. And the first person to show up was Annie Scholl. And you may recognize those of you who have read the book, A Certain Last Name. Um, Annie became the signifier of the beginning of this workshop journey that has brought us so many friendships and so much love um, through the years. So I had the essence of Becca and I had the land. Um, and I had deep feelings about the creative life. Uh, I was studying at the time both N.C. Wyeth and Maurice Senda. And books are funny swirls of things. For me, they do not follow any outline or any form. They are felt. They are moved toward. They find their swirl and you stay inside the swirl and sometimes your language isn't working for you or your plot just sucks. But you stay there because you feel that um, something something magical could happen if you do. And because Becca graciously allowed me to write this book for her, I would send her early pages. Um, I was not going to give up on this book. It was really bad for a really long time, but Becca deserved a good book. Uh, so it's very emotional for me. There's one last component of this. Sarah has a brother named Hawk, 
he's named Hawk because he's obsessed with Treasure Island. And C. Wyeth, of course, famously illustrated the Scribner's uh, Treasure Island and other books. But Hawk has a very beautiful um, soul. And uh, I often bring my students from Penn into my stories in various ways. And Hawk's soul is based on one of my students there at Penn um, and his big eyes and his great compassion and his love for his sister uh, came from a young man that I met at Penn. So these are the components that, uh, that, that somehow live inside the vessel of a book called The Great Offending. I think you did a great job of answering a whole bunch of my questions at once. Um, and actually, you, you sort of touched on it, but um, you'd mentioned um, some great authors. And um, I was wondering if any of them had had some influence on the mister and, uh, and how you got to him as a character. You know, I am really blessed in my life to know a lot of artists and um, to watch their, their careers. And I'm also married to an artist and I'm very interested in, in, in that life, the creative life. Um, so I was thinking about N.C. Wyeth for various reasons. And N.C. Wyeth was this brilliant illustrator, but he wanted to be a painter. Um, and I, I thought about how does an artist get to be who he wants to be? And see why I've never ultimately um, could become the sort of uh, recognized painter he wanted to be, but he was beloved and still is as an illustrator. And, and Maurice Sendak for a long time, um, you know, he wanted to write as, as his editor Ursula Nordstrom um, said, you know, he wanted to create uh, good, uh, good books for bad children, right? And uh, he wanted to tell the truth of how, uh, of children's anxieties and their fears and all these things. He had to fight for the right to do that. And um, I think in my own life, I fought for the right to write and publish the kinds of books I like to do. And so, um, and my husband too. And I had a great uncle Lloyd, who was a great architect, and he fought for the right to do what he wanted to do. Um, so the Mr is hugely important to me. He's a signifier of artists who, especially toward the end of their career, perceived end of their career, um, decide that the most important thing is to write or create the most important and authentic piece of work. And I held to him and tried to find his story. And it took a really long time to figure out how to weave his mystery in and I should say, uh, Pam and Kathy, you talked about librarians, and Mrs. Kalen is the name of the librarian in this book who helps Sarah and Hawk learn about the mister who has come to move, he's moved in uh, to a silo there uh, on their farm. Excuse me, but, but no spoilers, right? Oh, I know. I'm only halfway through. <laughs> Mrs. Kalen. Okay, I so, okay, I carry on. Carry on, for people well, like me, halfway through, okay? Because um, all afternoon, John and I are, who is he? Who's the mister? Honestly, okay, so, so. So many things that I haven't told you, Pam, I promise. Well, now I know the connection when I saw you at um, Brandywine Museum talking about the N.C. Wyatt oh. letters, which I love, and now I see the connection with Treasure Island and Hawk and yeah. this book. Okay, thank you very much. <laughs> two, things, two things that you, one thing that's in my head, and let's see if I remember the second thing I want. Mrs. Kalen, the librarian, is, was my, the name of my second grade teacher. And she was someone who, uh, who <laughs> I was going to tell a funny story. That, here's a story that reveals a lot about who I am and was and why I live inside such walls, I guess. But everybody in the class had been bad one day. I was the only one who wasn't, apparently. And everybody had to write a hundred times, I will be good. And I was exempted from this, and I was horrified that I was exempted. But Mrs. Kalen somehow saw something in me. She stayed in my life for a long time. I remember my high school graduation, she sent a gift. Um, and so Mrs. Kalen is really important. And about Scribner um, and, and MC wife, Kate, Caitlin Dooley, who beautifully um, edited this book, uh, for, for me, for us, Simon Schuster. Uh, she, for a while, for a long time, I think, um, had responsibility for those Scribner's classics. So I wanted to plant 
something inside the book for her. And Karen Grensick, who is my agent, you'll see that there's a Grensick arm. And so I try to plant things inside of my books for people who have been there for me. Great. I've I, known you since I opened the bookstore about seven years ago, and, and you managed to write, I, we were just discussing at least 10 books in that period of time. Um, and this book did feel very, after talking to you, it felt very personal to me. Like it felt like you would put a lot of yourself and, and what you think into it, I, which I think you do with all your books, but this one even more so. Um, how do you decide what stories you're going to tell? They have to ache. They can never be um, sort of manufactured. I have to feel that I'm living the story. And, you know, even though I do have books out there, these books take a long time. You know, they overlap, they frustrate, they don't come out, they don't come out the way I want them to. Um, but I'm always, um, I will only enter into the long process of writing a book and all the pain in addition to the joy that creates. Um, if, I am, if I am certain that I can um, write it authentically, and often that means I have to put my, myself for those I love in it. Um, if I think it can make a difference, I wanted to make a difference with this book. I wanted young people with Marfan syndrome to see themselves and the beauty uh, that they can create. I wanted to, to talk about the imagination. I wanted to talk about healthcare access. Um, I wanted to talk about the earth, <laughs> it is Earth Day, and why it matters and how beautiful it is. And I wanted to inspire young readers to just look outside at the stars at whatever it is, to wait for the rain, to collect it in a pot. Um, so I will only engage in a book uh, if I feel that I can be proud of it at the very end and that I can look at it with a certain degree of, yeah, you gave it your all, you never gave up um, when it sits there on my shelf. I think you definitely achieved that. <laughs> Sometimes. <laughs> this book in particular. Um, getting a little more specific then with Earth, Earth Day, what does Sarah's Museum of Seeds signify for you? I know it's very important to her. Well, Becca, as you know, um, I thought of Gay Lacey when I was reading about Sarah's Museum of Seeds. I thought, oh, Gay would like this. I hope Gay does. <laughs> um, the seeds are well. Becca, as I mentioned early on, has a um, sort of a plant collection around her bed in her bedroom, and she sends me photographs. Um, I also garden. One of my early books was uh, Ghost in the Garden. Um, about Chanticleer Garden, but about my own growing understanding of seeds. I've been sent seeds once by Susan Strait, a friend who's a writer. Years ago, she sent me a jar of seeds and they're gorgeous, their geometry is beautiful. Um, but Sarah, as all characters do in books, needs to be defined not just by the plot, not just by her relationships or about any condition that she might be facing, but also by what she loves. And I wanted to give um, Sarah seeds because seeds represent possibility. You know, a flower <laughs> blooms and is beautiful and then it leaves these seeds behind and the process can start again. And Sarah doesn't know if she's going to survive the condition that she has. And, um, but she knows that she can leave something behind. She knows that if she takes care of these seeds in her museum of seeds, um, that, that even after her, beauty will be, and, and, and hence her museum of seeds. Um, I've had authors in the store who've said that they have absolutely no say whatsoever in the title of their book. And I've had others who say all they have to do is actually pitch the title, and then they get the next book you know, published. Um, where do you fall on the spectrum? Good question. You decide on your Very title? good, Kathy. <laughs> Go ahead, uh, Beth. Yeah, um, I am not anyone who's ever pitched a title and got a <laughs> contract, and I do not think I'll ever be that person. Um, the Great Upending was not the original title for this book. The early pages of the book, uh, it was called No Strings. 
And in fact, I made a copy of this book for Becca with a photograph that I had taken of the farm, the road of the farm, and it was called at that time, No Strings. I wanted her to have an early version in her hands to hold. Um, and the great upending, um, Caitlin and her team, they were thinking about various um, possibilities and the end of the book has a lot to do with what the title is. But um, we played with it together and we had a lot of fun playing with it together. And I have to say, it was um, more fun finding the title of this book than it has been for any other book I've ever done. It seems very fitting. <laughs> it's nice to It's also uh, very um, relevant to today. Um, Sarah's an able to, to go to school. And um, I was wondering if you think she'd have any words of advice for everybody who's stuck at home at the moment. <laughs> ah. Sarah is highly educated. Mm -hmm. It's just not in, in, in a traditional classroom setting. You know, her, her mom and, and her dad are teaching her life through the medium of the farm and through the other ways that, that they're learning together. And uh, I think the most important thing right now is to look and to see. Um, there's a lot of waiting and a lot feels like it's on hold. And yet there's so much happening outside the, our windows, the, the trees with the, with the sky colors, um, with any walk, if any of us can, can take them. I'm, I'm blessed that I can take walks here in my neighborhood. Um, and I think seeing is the first step, you know, curiosity and seeing. And you can create any number of activities just if you decide that I'm going to be curious today. I'm going to look at something and think about it and realize all the things I don't know about it. And then I'm going to research that thing. And I'm going to maybe write something about it or a newspaper story about it or put it into a poem or make it part of fiction. But I am somehow going to learn something new today and own it by placing that knowledge into something. And I think there's a lot of opportunity for us to do that. Um, a friend of mine from my church, the other day we were, um, we were Zooming with some of the young people we're privileged to, to hang out with, and he told them that he was, he was learning the language, the Basque language, and we're like, Jose, what, why? You know, and it's like, because now's the time. And I was talking to a friend of my, Debbie Levy's son um, earlier today, I had a beautiful conversation with him, and he showed me these drawings that he's making, and um, it's just beautiful beautiful what people are deciding to do with the time we have and here you choose your own words and it, and it, and it reflects your attitude um, is a time that we've been given is a time that's been stolen from us um, right now with children at home let's help them think about this as given time and what can we become during this time that is very good advice um, I want to make sure that I don't monopolize uh, the Q&A, um, and I'd like to open it up to, to everybody who's here. Um, if uh, anybody would like to ask a question and they go down to the bottom toolbar um, under participants and click there, uh, they'll see at the bottom of the participants column a little like um, bubble that they can click on to raise their hand and Beth can call on them. Um, you're also going to need to unmute yourself to ask the question out loud. If you don't have audio, you can actually type it in and, and we'll ask it for you. Um, and it, I imagine that with this group, we're going to have plenty of questions. But um, So, Kathy, if I fail, as I often do in technology, um, and, let's see how this works. I, I will. If you can't see people raising their hands, I'll tell yeah. you or something like that. Great. Um, and if people have trouble raising their hands, um, and they unmute and yell, one of us will respond. <laughs> well, I see Helen McGreen and Annie Scholl have their hands up already. So your pick, Beth. <laughs> oh, I, let's start with Annie and then we'll go, we'll go to, because you know, Annie was the first on the farm, drove up the next walk, gave us a big hug with her bright blue eyes. <laughs> hey, Annie. Hi, Beth. It's not really a question, but mostly just deep gratitude to you, friend, because I think you keep you keep us going. You know, I'm I know you as a student and I know you as a reporter interviewing you for, you know, different things. But, you know, you keep us going and I can't wait to read your beautiful book. I've had it for a little bit here and I just haven't gotten to it yet. 
um, but I look forward to reading it and I'm just grateful for, you know, you continuing to do the work that you love. You inspire me and you inspire all of us. I'm sure of that. So thank, thank you. you. Thank That's you. all. I don't have a question. What kind of a journalist am I? But I, <laughs> I just wanted to say that. So I love that. And, and Annie, not knowing the, not knowing that Beth based the family on a Shoal family. I was shocked when I saw you come into the room and I thought, I know her because <laughs> yeah. I'm halfway through the book and I know your family. That's <laughs> so funny. welcome. I, I look forward to it. Wait till you I, read it. You're going to uh, love it. I, love it, I look, love it, love it. I look forward to it. And I, um, my family, I found out when I was looking to, to go to that workshop with Beth, is from this area is like an hour away and when i was driving home from i'm i'm from iowa originally but i live in north carolina now and i was driving home i actually saw a sign that said shoal lane and i think i told you about that beth too and it was just so fascinating that my my family you know came over you know came from germany and that and and they were in pennsylvania then migrated to um to iowa and so it was just, I couldn't, you know, you always know when you're supposed to be somewhere. And when I heard about Beth through a writer friend, I knew I was going to study with her. And then when I saw that, and then I found that out, I was like, <laughs> you know, I'm a person who looks for signs and I'm like, that, that's pretty clear. So anyway, thank you, Beth. What a privilege. Thank you. Thank, thank you, Annie, for being here. You bet. Where in North Carolina do you live, Annie? I live in uh, the center of the state, about a half hour south of Greensboro, um, about an hour and a half from uh, uh, Raleigh-Durham area. Yeah. I'm in Raleigh, that's why I asked. Oh, really? How awesome is that? I almost moved to Durham before this happened, but now I'm sort of glad that I live in a very remote area of, <laughs> of North Carolina, so I think I'll stay put. Thank you. Helen McCrane, maybe? Yeah. Hi. Um, uh, Beth, I was just wondering if you had any thoughts. Uh, Betsy Wyeth passed away yesterday. If you had any thoughts about Betsy? I was um, thinking a lot about her today, actually. Jen Bryant posted that. that as the first I had seen it. Jen, an amazing writer of children's books and tremendous researcher and friend. Um, and uh, Betsy Wyeth is the person who collected N.C. Wyeth's letters and she uh, and N.C. Wyeth didn't get along at first and it was in reading his letters that she became enamored uh, really of his of his mind and the way that he thought and communicated um, and we owe her that debt of gratitude and of course she was the great manager of Andrew Wyeth's career she was uh, often helpful in um, naming his, his paintings. She was his muse um, early on. She was absolutely beautiful. Uh, and, and very importantly, she played a very big role in founding the Brandywine um, muse the Museum there. And um, uh, I love that museum. I love that that land has been um, preserved and um, She's a part of my life. I actually have her signature. I um, NC Wise, this collection of letters. I couldn't find a, a, a you know a, a copy, so I had to get a used copy. And when I got the copy, I opened it up, and she had signed it to somebody. And I was like, wow. Um, so I have a little bit of her here. I hadn't heard that yet. That's yeah. <laughs> um, Chris Teeter. Hi. <laughs> Hi, Chris. And hi, Ellen. I have to unmute myself. I was, <laughs> excuse me. <clears throat> I was going to ask you, Beth, that sometimes when I finish reading a book, I've enjoyed it so much, I'm actually almost disappointed that I'm done the book. And I was just wondering from your perspective as an author, how you feel when you are finished writing a book, especially one that you, you know, you've enjoyed so much. Oh, that's a great question. Um, I can tell you that it was really hard to find the right ending for the great appending. And um, when I realized, you know, the deep interconnectivity of all of the characters in the land, it was a gift and I was extremely emotional about it. And uh, I found it difficult to copy edit the book 
in those final pages because every time I got there, I was crying, not because uh, my writing is, you know, I thought anything about my own work, but just that, oh my goodness, the mind does work. The mind does give you what you desperately want um, towards the end of these stories. Um, I felt when finishing this book and it went through, and Caitlin will tell you many drafts, um, or Caitlin's probably too kind to tell you that, but I'll tell you that. Um, I, I felt like I had something that was worthy of Becca, and that was, that was so important to me. And, and then you wait, of course, to see if anybody else likes the book. And um, I heard early on, actually, from someone in Kathy's bookstore. Um, I was in there one day buying something, and you know, someone who works there with her, I won't, um, didn't realize it was me, and she was reading The Great Upending, and, uh, and I asked her what she thought of the book, which wasn't kind of fair of me, and she started to talk about it, not knowing that I had written it, and um, I, I came home from that conversation knowing that it had um, touched her in, in the way that I'd hoped it would, and therefore um, maybe it had the chance of doing that for others. Yeah, and she doesn't ever spare any words either. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, oh, I see a hand. Hillary? So several of your um, protagonists over your last few middle grade novels have had some sort of medical condition. And I wanted to kind of know what inspired you to find one for every book that you've written over the last few. And also a question because I've not read um, Undercover in a while. And I'm wondering if the protagonist of that had a condition that I missed because I don't remember her having one. And I was curious if it was. Oh, no, like it, it's, um, undercover was very much based. It was very much based on me as a high school person. So that condition was being Beth Kephart, I would say, um, which is it must have its own medical definition somewhere. Um, it's not always that I've done this. In fact, it's really just the last. Um, I can't count maybe three or four books. Um, as I said, I have had the privilege in my freelance corporate life of talking to various people who are um, living with conditions that I feel need um, others to, to know about them, to respect them. Um, and so in This is the Story of You, the brother has Hunter Syndrome, which is something that only about 3,000 boys around the world have, but I've been interviewing over the course, you know, three or four times over the, over the course of several years, a young man who had it. Um, I, I, in, in One Thing Stolen, it's a, it's a, a mental condition that I've read about in, in the New York Times, and it seemed emblematic and sort of perfect I was writing in that book about the Florence flood of 1966 and about um, things that are overtaken and things that are clotted. And um, I, I felt that this mental condition was required um, and it was very interesting to research it and got to talk to the main doctor. Um, so I guess, you know, my degrees in the history and sociology of science, I've been writing about pharmaceutical issues and medicine for a long time. So I, um, I like to bring into my books things that I know and things that I can um, I feel like I can make a contribution beyond just the story um, and let others see themselves in these books in ways that are powerful and beautiful and that the characters are never defined by the condition, but they are defined by the, the, the cathedral of their souls, you know. Oh, I should see if anybody really has their hand raised. Uh, Beth, one of the things that sort of most impresses me about you as an author is how diversely you write. You write for middle grade, you write, um, done picture books with your husband, you've, um, you write a lot of memoir and um, books on writing. Are you writing them all simultaneously? Is something inspiring you at one moment to go one direction or the other? Or? I'm failing simultaneously <laughs> and currently at many things. I'm not sure that's not true. No, actually it is. Um, I don't write, actually the truth is that I don't really write a lot. Well, 
I will write intensely for two or three years on something till it, it just hits the wall and I can't find its solution and then something else is nagging at me. Um, but I never, I don't think you'll ever find me in the same week working on two different books. Um, I have to be in that interior and emotional space to keep the, the books within the tone and the mood that I'm trying to establish and, and they're all different tones and moods. So um, I, I often go for months without writing and then I will find something that means something to me. Um, Right now I'm working on um, picture books that are not, they're sort of, they're by, I have an Henri Wyeth book, for example, that's why I know a little bit about N.C. Wyeth. A, so there's an example of how much time I'll spend with a book. I spent a lot of time researching Henri Wyeth and thinking that I could write an adult novel about her. Um, it, it, the publishing houses really liked the book but felt that it wouldn't sell. So then I spent a year or two rewriting it as a novel for young adults, totally changing it, you know. And um, again, very beautiful responses, but it wasn't, it wasn't a book that was meant to be. And so then I um, happened to be talking to Amy Novesky, a, a children's uh, picture book editor. We were just having a conversation on the phone and I mentioned that I was sort of obsessed with Henriette Wyatt. And um, and so she asked me about that, and I wrote a picture book, and it's it's going to come out next year. It's exquisitely, exquisitely uh, illustrated by the amazing Amy June Bates, and I'm very excited about it. It's not a biography. I don't write picture book biographies. It is a day in the life of Anya and her father teaching her to see and to paint while all of her siblings do their own thing. But that's not the only thing that Anya Wyeth ended up in, in the uh, memoir that Laura Stanfield, who's on here, I'm waving to you. Um, there is uh, within one of the sections of wife, daughter, self, a, a long essay about my chase after Henriette Wyatt. So was I working on the, the essay at the same time as the picture book, perhaps um, uh, in terms of refining my ideas about them, but it wasn't like I'd wake up one day and say, today I'm gonna do two things, write some of the picture book and write and refine that essay. I, I just can't do that. That's really, that's interesting. Um, so I, I, you know, this is always sort of the, the, the final question, but um, what are you working on at the moment? I know you have some books coming out. Anything you'd like to tell us about? <laughs> um, well, I have what will be, I'm pretty sure, my last novel um, called Cloud Hopper coming out um, in the fall from Penny Candy Books, uh, another book that took an enormous amount of time and energy. Uh, and love, and I have the the memoir, Wife, Daughter, Self, coming out in around Valentine's Day next year, and Henriette, the Henriette Wyeth book, um, and I can paint it, it's called, is coming out at about the same time. Um, I'm trying to think what's been actually announced. Um, the, the other picture book that's been announced, this is really interesting too. Um, I mentioned that I had worked on a novel and published it with Chronicle Books called One Thing Stolen. And um, that, uh, there it is, there's that book, all the years I spent, you know, going to Florence, interviewing people who had experienced that flood, creating that story. And then Amy Novesky, working for a different house, she worked at the time for two different houses, another, um, said uh, Rob, Roberto Innocenti, who's a very famous illustrator, um, now 80, I think, living in Florence, Italy, so I've been very worried about him, um, wanted to do a book with this house, and they were searching for a story for him to illustrate. And um, I uh, wrote something that uh, he had experienced the flood in Florence, but when he was 25 or so years old. And I wrote a quasi memoir of a little boy, but taking, so we went back and forth through translators, um, the details of his life as a child in Florence and the feelings he had when he saw so much destruction of his beloved Florence. And I wrote a um, sort of poem, long poem that he's currently illustrating and I can't wait to see what happens. And there is another book that I am, I don't think it's been announced yet, but it's a, it's a historical uh, picture book that um, was very challenging to write because I, 
this person had achieved a lot in his life and I want always my picture books to feel very relevant to children, to not feel like they're being talked to or instructed. I want the picture books to feel very engaging, like the child's right there in there. So I'm, I'm trying to open the bias of my language and my ideas. And so I'm working on that sort of thing. And then I have um, two projects that I, that Karen Grinsick just sent out um, based around uh, someone I've been obsessed with for a long time. Um, and I really don't know <laughs> if there's anything. I do have another idea. But that sounds pretty incredible, although I have to like ask, because I, I was a little sad. Did you just say at the beginning that you thought this might be your last novel? But... Yeah, I'm pretty sure it wasn't. Oh, no, no, I mean after Cloudhopper. Um, yeah. Yeah. So you're enjoying more nonfiction at this point. It's not, it's not a matter of that. I think we all have a certain number of stories in us. Uh, all of my novels, and there are a lot of them, I don't even know the number now, but, um, and my memoirs, right? You know, so like more than 30 books have big pieces of me in them. Um, and I'm, I'm a small person. I'm not talking about my size, but my life, is, um, you know, I'm, I'm home, I make breakfast, lunch, and dinner, I clean the house, I sweep the floor. Um, I don't have this huge life. And uh, in terms of my experiences, I haven't traveled um, as widely as I would have liked to. And so um, unless something huge happens um, that gives me another in to another world, I don't see myself having what is required of a novel writer, which is both enormous imagination, well, not just both, many things, an enormous imagination, incredible perseverance, um, and a great faith that the story must be told. And every one of my books has felt to me like it must be told. And I don't have in my head right now a novel that must be told. I have essays, I have memoir, I have these unusual kind of poem picture books, explorations of people. I have books about um, writing, you know, but um, a novel, I just, I, I, I'm not in any way making theater of it. I just don't see it. And so you do have a lot of interest though, and you do, have a lot of insight into other people's lives and I will be surprised actually <laughs> at some point. Maybe not in the near future, but if I do, I will launch it with you, my dear. <laughs> um, and if that's one thing I noticed um, just reading the book, as I said, I'm halfway through. In fact, I may deliberately slow it down a little because they're so poetic. They're so engrossing and you get immersed well, in this case, you're on the farm with the Shaw family, Annie. Okay. So I'm, I'm there with you in spirit. And I can actually transport myself there when I open the pages. Or, okay, it's on my Kindle, but you know what I mean. Um, this time, living in the time of COVID-19, all of us being at home, and you'll see cartoons. Uh, there was one cartoon about that we may discover when this is all over that the whole thing was orchestrated by dogs. Have you heard that one? So a lot of people are at home with their pets, with their cats, with their dogs, and just getting a lot of comfort being with not just their family members, but with their pets as well. And what I love in your book is that those pigs, that horse, those chickens, they all have names. Yeah, and <laughs> I don't have them memorized yet, but when you talk about Mr. Mo, he's the horse, right? Okay. And I, that is so endearing to me. And maybe at this time, people now at home may open your book and then you really appreciate the fact that, um, you know, you introduce them to more furry friends. They're, <laughs> you know, in my mind, they're, they're non-human persons. They're furry, and feathered, fur, furry and feathered friends. Um, Yes. Well, Have you done that before? Having all those animals, naming all those animals in a book? It, 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 no, I mean, I, I try not to repeat myself. Um, <laughs> but, but, you know, the pigs are hawks named them, you know, for the characters in Treasure Island. And, um, and the cat is the cat that Becca had at the time, one of the cats. And uh, 
And, but I just, that's an honoring of Sally and Ken, whose, whose farm we spent that time on because they loved every single animal on that farm. They knew them, they loved them. And um, that's honoring their spirit. So I think um, every story tells you what to do. But I do think that spending time right now inside this book um, ties us back to, um, you know, to the elemental earth. And before we say goodnight, um, there's, I just wish I could talk to every single one of you. I, I really, really want you to know how much this means to me. But um, I don't want to put you on the spot, dear Becca. But can you just say um, hello to everybody? Because everybody knows how much I love you. Yes. How does she unmute? Um, yeah, there you go. Can you hear me? Yes. Hi. Um, I, I just want to say I, uh, I feel really privileged to have in some small way gone on this uh, journey with you, Beth. Um, it was really, really cool for me to see the iterations of the book and you would send me um, bits of a scene that you might consider putting in and um, really see the time and thoughtfulness that you put into it. Um, books were my escape, <laughs> always, throughout all my life. Because, um, you know, if you're, you're stuck at home or you're stuck in bed, what do you, what do, you do? You <laughs> um, So this was really cool to see, uh, to be a part of in some way. And I really appreciate that. Thank you very much. When we, thank you. When we first started to talk, you were describing the books in your room. You were describing the stories you loved. And, um, and I know Becca from reading your gorgeous emails and the interviews at Becca. If you want to know more about Becca, go to, go to my website, BethKephardBooks.com. There are two interviews. Um, well, one sort of a collection of letters uh, that I put together and then Becca answered these questions and she talked about the farm where she fell in love with animals when she was a child and um, just this brilliant um, uh, description of what it's like and what, what could be done better in the world. Um, and, and so, but I felt always, Becca, that I was corresponding with another writer um, and that, um, that the thoughtfulness that you kindly said went into the making of this book um, had to be there. Because remember, Becca, how when I first interviewed you, you had written down some of the things you wanted to say about your mom and how much you loved your mom. You had the words right there. You had given the thought to that interview. You know, so many times I interview people and it's what comes to mind. But you had prepared words of love for your mother. And how could I not love you? And how could I not? It's writer to writer here, Becca. This is, this is your book as much as it is mine. So thank you. And I'm just so glad you're here and that everybody got to meet you. Thank you very much, Beth. Yeah. Um, I have so much love for all of you and um, so much gratitude to Annie and to Pam and to Kathy. And, um, and, and we're all supporting these independent bookstores and uh, Kathy's Main Point Books is beautiful. And Louise is here up there. And uh, she was gonna come all the way from Connecticut to, uh, to be at the launch. And, um, you know, Jen, I know Jen, I saw you flash by and um, I know Star and uh, Jess and I, I can't see everybody, but, um, I have become this writer in part because of all of the people who have trusted me to um, explore ideas with them in various kinds of classrooms. So um, I'm grateful to all of you. Jason, you're one of those two. And, and everybody that I can't see, um, you know, I, I, uh, I value you and I wish we were all in a room. And if we were, it would be a 10 hour event and I would have a lot of cake. So thanks. I think this is the next best thing. Yeah. We can't can't be together, so I'm glad that um, that we're we're actually privileged to be safe wherever we are safe. And um, while there are people out there that are just 
helping us and risking their lives. And, and we're very privileged to be here tonight together and to share uh, the publication of this beautiful book, The Great Upending. And um, Kathy? I was going to say thank you guys for organizing this. It definitely made my evening. Um, if anybody, Beth will be signing the books, I'm, I'm sure with plastic gloves on and <laughs> face masks. Um, but if anybody would I like. like my face mask. <laughs> it's going to be very, I'm sure, cool. <laughs> um, yeah. But if anybody would, you know, like to um, a, a personalized book or a, just an autograph one. Um, they, they, you can order it on my website. And actually, Beth's got her own little tab. It says "Sign Books" at the top, and and you scroll down to her name, and it'll pop right up. Um, and anyway, this was just a very lovely way to spend an evening. And I'm